All right, so really quick in Acts, we've seen these Christians in the church of Jerusalem. They've been persecuted. Uh, now they are running for their lives. Uh, Luke, who wrote Acts, he's focused on one guy named Philip, one of these Christians who goes into the area of Samaria, and uh, he's preaching the gospel. People are getting saved. Then God moves him down to Gaza, Israel, where there's an Ethiopian eunuch, and God saves him, and he goes back to Ethiopia, and, um, and then uh, God supernaturally transports Philip uh, 30 plus miles north to Azotus in Israel. There's going to be a quiz on this, by the way, before you leave. And, uh, and transports him 30 some miles uh, north, and then he keeps preaching the gospel. And so that's all happening now. But then in the very end of Acts 7, chapter 7, um, Luke introduces us to a Jewish Pharisee, a spiritual leader, and his name is Saul. And Saul was there, and he was at the, he first shows up on the scene of the narrative of God's church and the, the advancement of the kingdom as a guy who helped murder the first Christian martyr, Stephen. And uh, so now Luke comes back in chapter 9 to that man, to Saul. And this is quite an amazing event here. So with that, let's look at verse 1. But Saul... Still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. The wording there, breathing threats and murder, means like it's consuming him. Every breath he's taking, he wants to kill the Christians. He is so tired of them. They're spreading. He wants to take them out. He wants to arrest them. He wants to murder him. them. He is consumed with hatred against God's people. And then it looks there, you go on, it says, when he went to the high priest, he asked him for letters to the synagogues, so synagogues are the Jewish places of worship, um, at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So we need to understand a little bit of geography to understand what's happening here, you have a map for us. And on the bottom, there's Jerusalem, and that's Israel, basically up to, you see the blue in the water, that's top part, Sea of Galilee, beautiful, and uh, just a little bit north of that. And then, and then the border would have ended. Damascus is in Syria. Damascus is in a different country. This shows you how much Saul hated Christians. He wasn't even just staying in Israel to hunt him down. He is going outside of Israel. He is going to squelch this heathen, uh, horrible thing of Christianity. And here's why. Because he was so zealous about Yahweh, the, the Jewish God. He thought he was doing the right thing. He thought he had the truth, and the truth was being challenged, and he was trying to stop it. Let me say this. Sometimes when we, even in, in love, challenge someone else's religious beliefs compared to Christianity, sometimes they're just going to lash out at you. It's just going to happen. And, and it's not necessarily that they're evil-hearted. It just could be that they're so convinced that they're of the truth and you're not, and they may, might sense that because you're challenging it that, you know, they, they've got to defend it, and it's going to happen sometimes. Which leads to a great question. We have a lot of belief systems in this world, There's a lot of passionate people in all of them. And so the question is, why can't they all just be right? Why can't they all just be part of the truth? And why can't we just say, well, what I believe is fine, what you believe is fine, and and can we all just get along? You see, well, and the question then would be, isn't that what Jesus taught? I mean, that, that sounds like the loving thing to do, because that's not what Jesus taught. In fact, Luke knew that. And look, look at the way Luke describes Christianity. Again, in, in verse 1, it says he went to the high priest. In verse 2, and Saul asked him for the letters to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found what? How does he describe the Christians? Those belonging to the way. Did you catch that? Those belonging to the way. It's not a way. It is the way. It is the only way. And guys, here's the thing that you and I also, we have been all been called to belong to the way, the way of Christ. You see, Christianity is not, Christianity is not one of many ways to get to heaven, although there are those people out there, right? Luke knew that. That's why he calls it the way, but also because that's also by this time now, really quick in the history of the church, 
the, even the secular world was calling these people the people of the way. Why? Because the Christians made it so clear that they were claiming exclusivity about how to get to heaven. So much so, like I said, even their enemies were saying, oh, those are the people, whether it wasn't always positive, right? But those, oh, those are the people that claim to know the only way to heaven. They're part of the way. So positive or negative, the point was, it was really clear what the Christians were claiming is that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Now, why is that? It's because that's what Jesus himself taught. And so a very familiar verse, a lot of us know it, maybe we haven't memorized. If you don't, I encourage you to do John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, not a way, but I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Later, John, Jesus says in John 8, 24, I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he you will die in your sins. He as in God's savior of your soul. In other words, if you don't believe in Jesus, what will happen to you according to Jesus? You will die in your sins. He is claiming exclusivity about how someone can enter into the kingdom of God. How can someone be forgiven and get into heaven? It's really clear from Jesus' own words. And then Peter clearly heard what Jesus said because later, by the time we get to Acts 4.12, Peter's saying the same kind of things. He says this, and there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. You guys hear the exclusivity? There is no question that that is what's happening in Christianity. There's a lot of well-meaning people. They're gonna try to say Jesus isn't the only way. They're gonna to try to appease and have this peace of, of religions to other religions and worldviews, but Jesus doesn't let us do that with his own words. The rest of the New Testament doesn't let us do that. So let me, let me hit on this couple points of application for us. First of all, if you're a child of God, if you're my brother or sister in the Lord, be absolutely unashamedly convinced and confident that we believe Jesus is the only way. Have no doubt about it. Don't feel bad if people make you, try to make you feel bad because you're claiming exclusivity because we didn't come up with this. The last time I checked, we are following Jesus and Jesus is the one who said, I'm exclusive. And so don't feel bad about that. Don't, don't you know, have a, have a holy and humble yet confidence in that because that's how it is. Because here's the thing, there's no question Jesus said it. But if it's not true, then all of Christianity is gone because he either lied or he didn't know something, which means he's not God, which means you and I cannot be forgiven of our sins. So there's no way around it. And so just be confident. It's okay. Because here's the other thing. If it's true, it's not arrogant to believe the truth. <laughs> if it's true, right? Now, let me say this if you're not a believer yet. We get it. There's a lot of worldviews out there. There's no way around it, guys. You're going to have to have faith. But here's the thing. One, you're, you're, you're practicing faith. Everybody's practicing faith. The question is, who or what are you going to put your faith in? And I'm just going to say it, it's... We believe from screaming evidence that I can explain to you sometime over a coffee that, that Jesus really is who he said he is, that Jesus really is the only way to heaven. And I want to remind you, because you probably heard of it, maybe you haven't, but Jesus went through great lengths in order to make it so you can go through him to get to heaven. He is the only way, and he's made, he died on the cross for you. He rose from the dead for you. He did all this stuff so that you can get on the way. It's not like there's only one way and tough luck. You can't get on it. You can't go through it. He has made it possible. So we can either be like, oh God, why'd you make it so hard? Only one way. Or we can be like, you know what? There's only one way, but thank you for making it possible that I can have a way because I don't deserve any way to heaven. Do you see the difference there? So I just, I just encourage you to, to believe, to repent of your sins, and here it is, belong to the way. Belong to the way. All right, let's go on. Verse three, we're gonna see another point of application here. Uh, now as Saul went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting but rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. 
Now, here's what's happened, guys. Literally, God has knocked Saul on his rear end. I love that because the Christians are running for their lives from this guy. But when Saul meets Jesus, there's no match. And Jesus humbles him, doesn't he? He puts him in his place. I love that power of the Lord. Now, notice, who does Jesus say Saul is persecuting? Does he say, hey, you're persecuting my children? Does he say, hey, you're persecuting my followers? No, look at the end of verse four. You're persecuting who? Me. Me. Guys, there's a really good point of application for us in this. Don't take persecution personal. Don't take persecution personal when it happens in your life. So let me, first of all, lay this foundation. Persecution's gonna happen. Persecution is promised by the Lord. I love this. You know how a lot of times as Christians, we're like, we can, I mean, there's like a billion books called the promises of God, something about the promises. Like we love the promises of God. It's like, okay, let's take all the promises of God though while we're at it, <laughs> right? Like here's a promise. He said, we're gonna get persecuted if we try to actually live our life for him, all right? So let me just share a couple of those passages, those promises of God that we conveniently try to leave out sometimes. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse, uh, verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, raise your hand if you desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, okay? Here's a promise of God. We're gonna be persecuted. Amen, hallelujah, <laughs> right? I love the promises of God. Here's here's another one Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 21. Brother will deliver brother over to death and the father his child and children children will rise against parents and have them put to death and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Thank you, Lord. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. There's another promise, right? But see, guys, there's just no way around it. Now, let me just say this really quick, though. If we as a Christian choose to live in our little bubble, we can avoid a lot of persecution. There's no way around that. But if we actually are desiring to live a godly life, which means that we are actually going out there, engaging our world with the gospel, you will be persecuted. And so I just want to put a little challenge here. I'll put it this way. The way I flip around 2 Timothy 3.12 in my life is this, Ryan. If If you're not facing persecution in your life anytime lately, Maybe you're not living the godly life as much as you're supposed to. Maybe I'm not engaging my world with the gospel as much as I should. So here's the thing, though. When the persecution happens, don't take it personal. What Jesus is saying here to Saul is it's ultimately persecution against Jesus, not you. It's the classic don't kill the messenger. We're just the messengers, And unfortunately, the messengers, a lot of times throughout history, it doesn't go well for the poor messengers, does it? And and we're the messengers, and and they're lashing out on us, but this is huge for us, that it's not really against us. They hate Jesus, not us, ultimately. I love that. That brings me comfort, because when I go through persecution in my life, I remind me of that self, and so I say, you know what? They don't really hate me. They hate Jesus, and that's their problem, You know, they don't really hate me. Instead, who am I? I'm a child of God that God loves so much. And so uh, I'm not going to grow angry against my persecutors. And say, I'm going to pray for them. And I'm 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 going to try to just keep loving them and serving them and sharing the gospel so that someday maybe God will break them of their hatred against Jesus and and that they'll actually repent and they'll receive, get this, the same forgiveness that I one, one time in my past received too. Because in my own sin, I was the same persecutor, if you will. I was the same. I'm no better than my persecutors, you see. And it's, but it helps so much not to take it personal. Because sometimes that's what the enemy loves to, to take God's people down and make us want to crawl in a hole in a fetal position. And let me just tell you, there's a lot of times that I'm very tempted to do that. That's the enemy, though. Don't take it personal. They really just don't like the Lord. And you know what I love about that, though? The last I checked, Jesus can take care of himself just fine. He's okay. He's got broad shoulders. Oh, it's so good. so encouraging. All right, we're going to read the rest of our passage. We're going to get a couple more points of application. Uh, We're going to look at verse 7 through 19. So just follow along with me. It says, The men who were traveling with Saul, they stood speechless. And hearing the voice but seeing no one, Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. 
And so they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus again. Look at the humility that God is bringing on to Saul. First, he literally knocks the guy on his rear end. Secondly, now he blinds him, so he has to hold grown men's hands to get somewhere. This is God humbling him. You know what? It's God's grace for him, isn't it? Because many, many times in our lives, guys, guys, God has to humble us, doesn't he? Before he can use us. And that's what he's doing with Saul. So look at verse 9 then. And, and for three days he was without sight and uh, neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. So, so apparently what Luke is telling us is now is that God has also again appeared to Saul and told him more details. Hey, there's going to be a guy named Ananias. He's going to come lay hands on you. Okay, and so that's what that's, what that's referring to. And so verse 13, but Ananias answered... Sorry about that. <laughs> Do you guys see that in your Bible? He coughed. Did you see that? Just make sure you're paying attention. No, just kidding. <laughs> Sorry about that. Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, now listen to this glorious, glorious statement. Verse 15. Go, for he, has chosen, he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. That is a, an amazing statement. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales from, fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. And then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. And for some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. And so there's two more points of application, at least, at least two that I can see come out of this. Here's, here's one of them. Rejoice. Rejoice. Why? Why should we rejoice? Because God chooses us no matter what we have done. God chooses us no matter what we have done in our lives. Go back to that glorious verse in verse 15. The Lord said to Ananias about Saul, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. So God is referring to Saul here. Saul's the guy who is at the, martyr, the murder of the first martyr, Stephen. St Saul's the guy who is now breathing every breath, consumed with hatred against God's people, hunting them down to arrest the men, women, and he's trying to kill them all. That's the guy that God is saying is a chosen instrument of God's. So here's the question. Did we miss somewhere that Saul repented to Jesus and that's why he's now a chosen instrument of God? No, Saul's actively against God right now. Saul is actively on his way to try to kill Jesus' people. And that is where we hear Jesus say, he's my chosen instrument. Guys, this is mind boggling. We should rejoice because God chooses us no matter what we have done. Let me highlight this, this principle, this concept out of Romans a little bit. Romans 5, 7. It says, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. Here it is. But God shows his love for us, you, me, us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus loved us while we were still spitting in his face on the cross. Jesus loved us way before we were ever sorry for anything. Jesus loved us while we were crucifying him with our sins. That is beautiful. That is scandalous grace. It's amazing. Here's another part where that concept comes out in Romans 9. And the context is, is that Paul's writing about Rebecca and Isaac and the twin sons they had. And how God chose one, one of these sons and listened to what he says. He says, not only so, 
but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they, the twins, had not yet been born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not what? Because of works, because none of them were sorry or anything good or bad, and nothing was done, but because of Jesus who calls. In other words, what he's saying is that before the foundations of the world were laid, God simply, because he wants to show off his power and his love, chooses people. And in this situation in our text today, he chose a murderous and a rebellious and a hateful guy named Saul to be his chosen instrument. And he, he knocked him on his rear. He blinded him. He then forgave him. He then saved him. And then he called him and sent him to share and spread the same message that he so much hated before. This is absolutely amazing because here's the thing. It had nothing to do with Saul's heart and where it was. Saul wasn't even sorry yet. In fact, God did all this to spite him. So I want to I try to hit this home all the way for our lives right now. No matter what you have done, if we repent of it, we can be forgiven. No matter what we have done, if we repent of it, we can be forgiven. You're like, no, you don't understand. I've, I've, made some, I've done some serious lies that have hurt some people in serious ways. Doesn't matter. I've stolen some things that really brought a lot of pain on other people. Doesn't matter. I've bullied some people pretty seriously. It's really, I think it's really jacked them up for the rest of their life. Doesn't matter. I've made fun of Christians. Doesn't matter. I've looked at porn. I'm still addicted to porn. Doesn't matter. I've had an abortion. Doesn't matter. I've committed adultery, doesn't matter. I've murdered someone, doesn't matter. Guys, this is scandalous grace. If we repent of anything and everything to the Lord, his grace is sufficient. His grace is plenty. His grace is amazing. And he will forgive us for anything we have ever done. This is such good, beautiful news for all of us. And then especially some who the enemy has tried to make you think there's something you have done that you cannot be forgiven of. That is a lie from Satan himself in your heart. Rejoice. God chooses us no matter what we've done. Rejoice. He will forgive us for anything we have done. If he can take a guy named Saul who is actively killing his own people and choose even before he was ever sorry he was going to save him, and then go about and then forgive him and then use him. Loved ones, he can do the same thing for you and I. Does that encourage you today? Rejoice in that. Rejoice in that. I praise God for that. I am so unworthy. But God is so amazing. All right, one last point for us. It's tied to the same kind of concept there, but here's a different angle. You're chosen. If you're a child of God, you've repented for the Lord, you're a believer, you are chosen. So what? Keep going and be faithful. You're chosen. So keep going and be faithful. What we have here is we have two different chosen instruments of God in this event. We've got Ananias and we've got Saul. Ananias, he gets called by the Lord to go into a dangerous situation. He's like, oh, Lord, you don't understand about Saul. And God's like, no, I, I think I know what's going on. Don't worry, right? But he, he's called into a dangerous situation. But, but, but it's cool. He didn't have to suffer, did he? he? He had a fruitful ministry. He got to lead Saul to Christ, who then later becomes Paul. I mean, Ananias is the guy who got the, the opportunity to do that. That's cool, right? Let's take Saul. Saul's also an chosen instrument of God. He eventually goes into many dangerous situations, but his lot was to suffer a lot. In fact, Jesus right here even says, hey, by the way, I'm going to save you so that you can suffer a lot for me. He's like, thank you, Lord. When you, got, when you became saved, did God tell you that? Like, hey, by the way, I'm saving you so that you can suffer a lot for me before you get to heaven. It's like, thank you, Lord. But that was his lot. Now, thankfully, it's cool. He has obviously a lot of fruit also, right? Probably a lot of us who could probably trace it back. We're saved today because of what Paul did. Now, here's the thing. No matter what, either way, they were both chosen by God what to carry Christ's name to the ends of the earth, and so are we. 
So no matter what the reactions are of the people that we carry the name of Christ to, whether it's positive and fruitful, whether it's negative and persecution and rejection, God is always working. God is always working. If someone rejects the gospel through us, or, or let's say it's a discipleship thing, where you're trying to disciple someone in your small group or relationship, and they reject it, and you, you know your heart and your heart gets hurt, but you know what? Be encouraged. God's still working. God is always working. What's our job? Just keep going and be faithful. Because God is working and he's faithful. So I want to, I want to spend the rest of our time, just, I want to marinate in God's word on this point. Now, I want to, I want to be, I'm going to be frank here. If you as brother, sister, and Lord, if we are not facing persecutions in our life because we're not sharing the gospel, this will just fly over your head. Just going to be honest. So again, let, let that kind of maybe challenge us. Like, mm, maybe I need to get out there more. Maybe, not that we're looking for persecution, but you know what I'm saying? But let me say this. If you have been persecuted or currently are being persecuted because you're trying to share the gospel with someone, and that can look like a lot of different forms, even, even just like people don't want to hang out with you, feel lonely because of that, whatever it is, this is going to minister to your heart and your soul like it does to mine. Listen to what God says. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 25, he says, It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, what he's saying is he's the master, Jesus. He's saying, you get this, people called Jesus Satan. That's how crazy they were. That's how much in sin they were. They called Jesus Satan. Um, I don't know about you, but I haven't had anybody call me Satan yet, so it's not going as bad as it did for Jesus yet. But that's what he's saying. And he says this then. He says, how much more will they what? Malign those of his household. You and I, we are of the household. He's saying, it actually is going to be worse for you at times. And he says, so have no fear of them for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What he's saying is, listen though, I know it's going to be hard. I know it's going to be hard. But what they're doing will not be overlooked by me on judgment day. If you don't get justice on this side of eternity, don't worry, I'll take care of it in the end. That's what the Lord's encouraging his disciples and you and I today. So then what's our, what should we do? And I love this in verse 20, he says it. And do not fear though those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. He's like, don't fear them. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, only care about what I think about you. Only fear me. Only care about what I think about you. And I love this though. You don't want to just stop it there. And then he says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. Here's what he's saying. You should only care and fear, you know, what I think and fear me. And you know what I think about you? I love you so much. I'm willing to take care of sparrows. You know how much more I'm willing to take care of you? And so in so many words, he's saying, children, keep going be faithful because I'm working and I'm faithful there's another time when Paul knew this concept he says in Romans 8 28 and we know that for those who love God all things the good the bad and the ugly all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose so brothers and sisters, keep going and be faithful because God is working and he is faithful. Joseph knew that this was what it was because he said this to his brothers who had done much harm to him in Genesis 50, 20. He says, but as for you, brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Joseph got this. Guys, keep, being, keep going and be faithful because God is working and he is faithful. Jesus told us in Matthew 28, 20, teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. And I love this. He said, and behold, I'm always with you to the end of the age. He's saying, keep going and be faithful. I am working and I am faithful. Let me just give one more as we marinate in this. Luke 9, 62, Jesus said this to us. He said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. He's saying, listen, I, I get it. 
When you're out there working the fields of souls, it's going to be hard. You're going to be persecuted. <clears throat> you can't stop. You can't look around, be worried, this and that. You keep going. Put your hand to the plow and be faithful. Because I'm working even when you can't see it. And I'm faithful. Would you close your eyes with me? Again, this is really a big point for those of my brothers and sisters. You have faced some form of persecution, hardship, mockery, or isolation because you have been trying to carry Christ's name to your world in some way. This is for you. Let these scriptures encourage you today. Lord Jesus, I, I just thank you so much because it's hard. It's hard to be used of you sometimes because people lash out at us. People make fun of us. People don't want to be with us. People, they take it out on us. But Lord, we thank you so much that first of all, you, you try to give us a heads up on it. It doesn't surprise you. And most of all, what we love is that you even take the persecutions themselves and turn them and bring them to beauty and to good things. In other words, that God, even if the bad things happen, you are always still working and you are faithful to us. I pray, Lord, that you would just encourage us in that. Lord, help us to to keep going. Help us to keep our hands to the plow. Help us not to look back. Help us not to want to give up. Lord, we want to run this race. We want to finish it strong because you are worthy of it, Lord. Because of what you have done for us, Lord, we make a, a vow again today. We will keep going. We will be faithful because you are to us. Thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and worship.